Dave from the Wizards Keep in Muncie, Indiana. And today I'm going to finish counting down my top 60 board games of all time. In this video I'll be counting down number 10 all the way to number 1. We finally made it. And by number 10 is uh, from designer Juve Rosenberg. If you've been watching these other videos, you know I'm kind of a fan of his work. And um, this is not his last entry on the top 10. But this particular one is a worker placement game called Feast for Odin. And this is going to take two hands. It's a pretty hefty box. Feast for Odin, as I said, is a worker placement game where um, kind of a little bit of difference on this one is you're going to have different slots on the board where you could either place one worker for an effect, two workers for a better effect, three workers or up to four workers for like a best effect or super effect. So it's kind of interesting as you're kind of deciding when, you know, you, you can either get more actions by spreading your workers out on, on a, uh, action spaces that take less workers, or you can get to really big effects by placing multiple workers on one spot. So it's kind of the kind of this choice that you're trying to make between those, which I think is kind of interesting. This also has, you have a home board, because in the theme of this, you're, you're different Vikings setting up your feasts for Odin, but you're also going on raids and getting different loot. Uh, and those loot you're gonna take back to your home board and, and uh, place them on the board. And uh, that's kind of representing the different treasures you've gotten from your raids to show your greatness in the eyes of uh, Odin. Um, but those pieces, they're going to be like different shapes. Like, you know, it could be like a goblet that has a goblet shape to the, to the piece or a crown or a scepter or different items. And you're kind of placing those boards and they have different shapes. So sort of like a Juve Rosenberg's game Patchwork. Uh, where that's kind of quilting shapes. This is, you know, represents, like I said, the loot from your raids. But you place it on your board, and they can do a couple things. One, mostly it does, is it's going to cover up. There's like every space in your home board has like um, worth negative victory points. So every time you cover up the space, you're effectively earning victory points for those for those items you're putting on your home board. But also you can surround different other symbols, which will be like a um, stone or ore or something and when you if you surround those symbols during your income phase you're going to generate those things as income um, so that you can you can use that for different resources to build different things so there's a lot of things going on this is kind of like a combination of a lot of different Juve Rosenberg games kind of all smashed into one and uh, I like it quite a bit and that is Feast for Odin my number nine is also a worker placement game. Um, as I said in previous videos, I'm a big fan of worker placement games. So you're going to see a lot of these on, on this list. And uh, this one here is Pursuit of Happiness. Now, Pursuit of Happiness is kind of like, it's been described as like the game of life, if the game of life was good. Then kind of the mass market game of life is pretty much, you know, that instead of a roll your dice and move your people, it's just, you know, you flick your spinner and just kind of see what happens. You know, there's not a lot of decisions in that in that game. This one uses the worker placement mechanic, but the workers are like hourglasses and they represent your time, which I think is kind of an interesting concept. Um, maybe it gets a little philosophical, where you only have so much time each, you know, in your life and you're going to use those time units as workers to place in different uh, sections to get different actions or different, different things for uh, your... You know, represents the life of your your character that you're kind of uh, running through this game. It starts off with like, and you have uh, so many round or so many turns in the game. Each turn kind of represents a decade of your character's life. So you start off as a teenager, and you kind of uh, go to school, or you can get you know do different activities as you do as a teenager. Then that's round one, round two. Now you got to get get a job, and maybe you'll start dating for your character so you can get like into relationships with your character. You can acquire different items. That's neat. A lot of these things. The victory points in this game is kind of happiness units. So the happier your your character is, you know, the more you're winning, and you can get get that kind of I guess happiness by the different items that you can collect and get like the big screen TV, your board game collection. You can form different clubs or different activities. You can, your jobs can bring you happiness or, um, you know, your relationship can bring you happiness. So it's a lot of interesting things. It's kind of like a, a you, when you play the game, not only are you playing the strategy game, it's also kind of like a little story, almost like an, you know, an RPG of going through this character's life. The other interesting thing is you can have to worry about the health of your character. You might sacrifice some happiness. You know, you're, maybe you're exercising or you're you know, dieting, which isn't necessarily the funnest thing to do, but it's going to prolong the health of your character, which actually may give you more turns. 
because your character lives longer. And that's kind of an interesting idea. So, you know, as you play the game, some characters, players may not last as long, other characters die. Um, but, you know, that's another strategy. You could be the, you know, live free, die young type of person. So you run up a bunch of points of happiness because your character's really happy, but they die really, really early. But it was the happiest short life that you know, you could ever have. And that's one strategy as well because maybe if you can bank enough points, even somebody who lives longer and gets more turns, maybe they don't accumulate as many points. But it's just kind of an interesting theme. It's um, a theme you don't see in a lot of games. And it's just kind of fun to kind of you know build a character and go through their life. And that's Pursuit of Happiness. Um, my number eight, besides Juve Rosenberg, another designer I talk a lot about in these videos is a guy named Ryan Lockett. And uh, he is known for, kind of, he's, he's an artist and a game designer and a publisher. So he designs his own games, he does the art for his own games, and he kind of publishes his own games. So he does everything all in one. And he does an amazing job at that. And this is the, the I guess, the highest placing Ryan Lockett game on my, my list. And that number eight, that is Islebound. As you kind of see, all the Ryan Lockett games kind of have their own distinct artistic style, and this one's you know no different. Islebound is kind of um, it's kind of hard to describe exactly what type of game. It's sort of like a pick up and deliver type of game, or has some feelings of pick up and deliver. But what you do is you've got a ship, and you take that ship to different locations on the board, to basically different cities, and based on the cities you go to. You have to pay an entry fee when you go into that city, so you need like different resources uh, to to move around the board. Um, and but depending on where you go in that city, you're going to get different things. That's what gives it a little bit of a pick up and deliver feel. Because sometimes you might be taking some goods from one city, like you get wood in the city, and you take it to another city to kind of you know you know you, you get that wood and you take it go to another city and use that wood for something else. So it kind of feels very pick up and deliver where you're kind of mapping out your route across the board. But there's a lot of other things going on too because each place almost feels maybe a little worker placement because you're when you go to those cities you're kind of placing your ship on different locations. And you can do things to kind of extend your sh your, your ship's speed um, so you can get to more locations in a, in a board. Because in normal worker placement games you pick a worker and just put it on a spot. This one you can't usually get to every spot on the board so you kind of have to map out different turns um, what you're going to do each turn kind of say like, well, this turn I'm going to get to this location because in the next turn I'll be close to this other location to get something um, you can also build up a military and you can like you know gather pirates and sea monsters and those pirates can go fight their fight different cities you go to if you fight a city you kind of conquer that city and if you conquer a city you usually get some sort of monetary reward and now you control the city which means if you go to that city you no longer have to pay the entry fee for it so you got a little bit of area control in there as well as so you're kind of gathering you know different cities um, to kind of build an infrastructure so you don't have to pay your entry fee each time you, you go there. Or also, you, you don't have to just be competitive. You know, some cities you can actually take over dipl diplomatically. So if you want to, you know, feel a little less violent, you can kind of smooth talk them and then they'll end up liking you and then you're suddenly you can you control that area like you've been elected to their mayor or something like that. So it's got a lot of different things going on and I like, I just, I always like the, I was getting gross in a lot of the Ryan Lockett games because he has such a rich world. And um, this one is no different, and that is Islebound. My number seven, as you're probably going, you know, maybe getting tired of hearing this name, it's another Juve Rosenberg game. And that is his two-player worker placement game of Fields of Arl. Now, sometimes I kind of feel with Juve Rosenberg games that sometimes maybe they're too similar. Like, there's just a lot of similar. You can kind of play, you know, the last video I talked a lot about Caverna and Agricola. Those were to be the most. Those games are almost interchangeable. They kind of feel like the same game. Uh, some of these others will have some twists or some differences to them, but this you can still tell they're a Juve Rosenberg designed game. So in some ways, that's kind of a, a negative of some of his games because they maybe lack a little originality from each other. But also, that... A somewhat unoriginal game that he's designed is so good that every one of his games I like. And Fields of Arl is no exception. Fields of Arl is a two-player only game, at least with the base game. And um, what you're going to do in that is it's um, you're playing through different seasons. But anyway, you, you're playing through year, but you have like a, a summer season and a winter season. A lot of Juve Rosenberg games have kind of a farming theme to them. So you're going to be farming during the summer, which allows you certain action. It's a you know, worker placement game, so you're going to place your workers on different spots on the board. And in the summer, you've got certain actions you can do only during the summer. And then in the winter, 
you have other actions you can only do in the winter. It's very thematic. There's actually a book in here. He's like done tons of research on Arl, which is kind of this small farming community in uh, in Germany. And there's tons of different, you know, he's done tons of research for that area and the time period he's placed this game. So um, that's kind of interesting as well because it really fits the kind of theme of the area. But it's a... Uh, not much more to say about it that I haven't said about the, all these other games. But this one just kind of... What I think I guess I like about this the best is it's just got a lot of different options. Because you've got... You're, it's kind of a point salad game. where Which that means you're kind of going to... You've got a lot of different spots you can do. You On a given turn, you can guess... You have lots of different strategies or different options to win. You can gather a bunch of resources, like different, you know, raise cows and then skin them for leather and then take that leather and build them into leather goods. And, and that, you, so you just accumulate a lot of resource, or a lot of like shirts and leather aprons and boots. And, and each one of these goods, as you manufacture them, they become worth more and more points. So you can go that route, or there's kind of a traveling area. You can kind of travel around to neighboring cities, and you're going to get different money for kind of traveling. It kind of represents trading with those nearby towns. And you also get experience, which kind of gives you more victory points. Um, there's uh, the more traditional Juve Rosenberg game route, where you're breeding different animals for points. Uh, you kind of, So you get that situation where it's almost like an engine building, because if you get... Uh, a lot of Yusei Rosenberg games, you get like multiples of an animal in a pinned-in area during, um, in this case, the, during the winter phase, they're going to breed. And so they'll just continue making more animals, and each animal's worth so many points. So you can kind of build up this engine where the animals breed and make points for you. So there's lots of different things you can do in this one, and that's why I like it uh, about it. And that is Fields of Arl. <clears throat> My number six is another Juve Rosenberg game. This is the last one on the list. So this is my favorite Juve Rosenberg game. And Juve Rosenberg game, or Juve Rosenberg is a designer. He's known, like obviously, as you can tell, for his worker placement games. And this is kind of a worker placement game. But you only have one worker, and you place on a spot. And you may not use him every turn. You just place him on a spot, and it's going to generate some action. But then you might, um, usually for different buildings and things like that, you're going to be buying... Um, and that is my, so my number six, and that is Lahav. And what I mean by that, so you, you have, uh, like I said, one worker, so it doesn't feel that much like a worker placement game. But what you're doing is each turn, you're using that one worker, so you're basically picking actions uh, to, um, what you can do with that is either put your worker on a building, either the building that's in a marketplace, or you can buy a building or build a building in, in your tableau. And you can use put your work on there to generate some sort of action, either make you know turning clay into bricks or um, building boats or different things like that. But the other thing is kind of interesting is when you build a building, it's sort of more of an investment because when you build a building, that opens it up. Not only now you can place, let's say you, when you build the wharf, it allows people to build boats. So you build the wharf. Not only does that now in, incorporate put the option of the game that you know now you can build boats in the game, everybody can. So everybody can put. Their worker, you can put your workers in other people's buildings, but you don't pay an entry fee for putting your worker in buildings you own, but you have to pay entry fees to put your worker in buildings you don't own. So if it's like in the communal area, you just kind of pay it to the bank. But if someone else owns that building, let's say someone else owns the wharf, when you put your worker on there, you got to pay the entry fee to the other player. So there's a little bit of an investment. I, you, know, you kind of see a certain strategy developing. You're like, I'm going to get this building. That way other people are going to want to pay me for that building. So that's kind of an interesting idea. The other thing is you've got lots of different goods in this game, but um, which is typical of a lot of Euro games. You're taking goods or different resources and use them for things. But this one was kind of interesting because you're taking a lot of these goods and you can either use the, the raw goods or you can, usually by using an action of a building, kind of modify those goods. Like I said previously, you can get clay, which clay is a resource that you can use for different things. But if you have the brickworks building, you can take clay and uh, turn it into bricks. And now you can take those bricks and do other things with them. So there's not, there's, so really like every resource in the game really doubles the number of resources because every resource has its base um unit and then it's modified unit that you use by or you uh, generate by using other buildings so it's got a lot of things going on i like that also every turn you've got a lot of different choices a little bit sort of um when i was talking about the fields of arrow a little bit of that kind of point salad because <clears throat> sometimes in worker placement games a little bit of the frustration might be is usually you put your 
your worker on a spot and that kind of blocks it for everybody else or if maybe if the game has some element where you can still use that spot usually if the place is occupied you're gonna have to pay some sort of fee to be able to use that spot too and so that can be a little frustrating sometimes with worker placement games where people are kind of blocking you well this one you can kind of do that because if you put the your singular worker on a building it is occupied but this one has just so many choices so, so like one building's occupied well okay i'll go do this so i can't build a uh, boat this because you're in the wharf this time well there's a bunch of wood piling up, so I'm going to go to the wood offer and take all the wood. Or maybe I could go and turn my wood into charcoal. So now, because wood's an interesting unit because it can be used to build things, or it could also be used to burn for energy because a lot of things take energy. When I was talking about like the brickworks, for example, to take clay and turn it into bricks, you have to you spend the energy, either wood or coal or something like that, to kind of you know bake the bricks. So there's a lot of the, the goods you need them for different things, but there's a lot of you, it doesn't. It's not like you take a good and make one thing with it. There's lots of different things you can make with it. So there's a lot of things going on, and that's why this is. And it's also a little different than a lot of the other Uve Rose. There's a lot of similarities between the other Uve Rosenberg games, and like I mentioned, that kind of unoriginality in some ways kind of taints it a little bit. But that his unoriginal game is so good that makes all the similar games good. Uh, this one has a little bit of a different twist, and I think that's. Um, one of the reasons I maybe rank it a little higher, and that is Lahav. My number five, this is a game, I've, I've played this one for probably 10 plus years. And uh, so this is a old, kind of an old school game, um, as far as board game goes. I talked to previous videos, I think, you know, something like Carcassonne, or well, Carcassonne's about 15 years old, or, or Dominion's like 10 years old, and I was like, man, that makes it in board game terms, because so many good board games are coming out every year, and the board, and Euro board games, and designer board games are so popular right now, that we're like in the gold, you know, they say we're in the golden age of board games, and I, and I believe that, because there's so many good ones coming out. And so sometimes you get a game that um, is only five years old, and it feels like, oh, that game is so old now. Well, this one came out like in the early 80s. And now board games really kind of, uh, with Settlers Catan in the 90s and then through this new board game revolution, board games have really kind of improved uh, uh, upon themselves. As one designer will come out with something, another designer will kind of improve upon that. And that's really what caused the snowball of these great board games. Well, this one came, like I said, came out in the early 80s. So it's really rare to find a game that old that has interesting. Uh, mechanics because a lot of them were like roll and move games like Monopoly and Sorry that were very very luck based well this one is Empire Builder so my number five Empire Builder and this is kind of like the quintessential pick up and deliver game and uh, it's a, a train themed game which a lot of train themed games are pick up and deliver because you're you've got trains and you're so you're taking on the one city to pick up goods to take to another city and so this one you know is that quintessentially and um that's one thing i like about it is i had mentioned previously i like games with puzzles and this puzzle is you'll get certain different tickets and the tickets are going to have three different options on those tickets either you might be taking coffee to seattle and you know for money or on that same ticket it may have the option of taking uh, automobiles to san francisco or uh sheep the Des Moines, Iowa, or something like that. And so they're in, they'll have different values. And usually the further you have to take something, so like coffee is usually found down in Mexico. So coffee is worth a lot, you, but you have to take a, it takes a lot of resources to get to it, either by buying tracks all the way down to, the, to southern Mexico, or just the time it takes to go pick it up and then bring it back and take it to another place like Seattle being up in the, in the north um the northwest corner is going to pay off a lot but it takes a lot of time to do so so maybe you'll make a shorter delivery that's not worth as much but you're able to make your delivery when you make your delivery you get paid and you get a new contract so you're kind of cycling through contracts faster also usually like i said a contract will have like three different options on the contract but usually also you normally typically have three different contracts at a time too so there's like nine different options um that you're kind of can pick goods up you know, certain, you know, certain cities will have certain goods. Like I said, coffees down in, in Mexico City. Uh, you might find um, tobacco in uh, Savannah, Georgia, or something like that. So um, you're kind of looking at the map and deciding. Well, you look where well, you look at your tickets, I guess, and or your contracts, and you're kind of figuring out. Okay, what is um, your 
you know, you try to develop that puzzle. It's like, okay, if I can pick up this one here in this nearby city, I can pick up cars here in Detroit, and then near, you know, near Detroit, Chicago, in Chicago, you can pick up tourists to take, and I can take these tourists to San Francisco, and I can take these cars to Los Angeles, and those are similar cities or nearby cities. So you're kind of building that puzzle, you're looking at each your, your your contracts to kind of visually build that puzzle. So we know where to pick up different goods and take them to another another place. So I like that puzzle, the cards laid out, and trying to figure out what's the most efficient way to t- you know to take those goods and make those deliveries. There's also um, I like um, I said previously games that kind of start off small and you kind of kind of build over time. And this one's that you you start off with just a, a set amount of money and you and you're build to build your tracks and you have no tracks on the board. So you so you build those tracks connecting different cities to pick up different goods to to fulfill your contracts. Well, you start off with a small area, but you when you ever do uh, sell a contract, you may you deliver your good and you sell your contract, you get money for that. And you take that money to either upgrade your train to make it go faster or carry more of a load, or you're going to um, build to build tracks to get to you know connect to different cities. And eventually, that's the what ends the game. Whoever gets the two hundred fifty million dollars and has five of the six major cities connected wins the game. So I, I that's why I like it. It's kind of like I said, the quintessential pickup and deliver game. And though it's a little old now, it's a little dry. It doesn't look as spectacular if you kind of look at the back. It's a very very bland looking game. It's literally like a dry erase board with dots on it, and you're connecting the dots with like a marker or a crayon. So uh, by today's standards, with all these beautiful components it looks very antiquated but still holds up really well and that is empire builder kind of along those lines not quite as old but by board game standards an old game is my number four another one that um has in like by board game terms is an ancient game even though it's probably only 15 maybe 20 years old but another one holds up really really well and that is puerto rico Puerto Rico is a kind of an action selection game. And what that means is that on your turn, you're going to pick a different role. And that could be like the mayor, which a mayor role. And that just gives you population. You get different population to kind of place them on different buildings that you that you may have possessed. And when you because those buildings usually need some, a person to occupy them to turn them on for their effects. Um, or you might pick a builder, which lets you build, build different buildings. Or... Um, you might pick the captain role, which allows you to ship different goods or victory points. But what really makes this game interesting is in a lot of games, you're kind of in a vacuum and think, well, what's the best thing for me to do? And then you figure that out and do that action. Well, this one, since when you ever you pick that role, let's say you pick the captain role that lets you ship goods. Well, then in turn order, everybody else is going to be able to take that action as well. So you have to kind of look around the board and see what other people are wanting to do. Um, and because in some cases, maybe the captain is the best role for you to take, but you may look at somebody else and go, they really, really want the captain. They've got more goods to ship. So you may not take that action. You may take a different action instead, which I think is very interesting. Kind of makes you think outside the box. Maybe you build the, pick the builder action instead because that's not necessarily the best action for you, but it's better for you than it is for everybody else. Um, you know, just because either it's better for you than everybody else, but also if you think, that somebody else is going to pick a different role. Maybe you've got a lot of money stockpiled and you think, so-and-so is going to pick the builder. I'll let them pick it. So they spend their action picking it, and you still get a build. So those are things you have to think about in this game. And that's what I like about it. The, the game mechanics are pretty simple, but the consequences of the action can be very deep, which is what makes this game so interesting. Uh, because anybody could probably pick it up and play it by the rules, but the the difference is, is an experienced player of Puerto Rico versus an inexperienced Puerto Rico is going to do very, very well or do a lot better than the inexperienced player because the inexperienced player may not see the consequences of picking certain actions. So they may pick Builder at the wrong time and just uh, to help somebody else out, which I just think is really, really interesting about this game. And for a long time, this was my favorite game. Um, but... Um, you know, it's one of those, I don't think my feelings of the game has changed. It's just better games have come out. And that's just the advantage of, you know, this board game revolution that we're in the midst of. Is be, people can look at some of these older games and improve upon them. But a few of the classics still stand up. And Puerto Rico is one of them. Speaking of newer games, my number three is a newer game. I think I've only played this in the last year. And uh, that is... Uh, a worker placement game of course but this one 
I guess this is the highest ranked worker placement game on my list, so I guess this makes my favorite worker placement game. Surprisingly, it's not by Uwe Rosenberg. It's instead by designer Shim Phillips, and that is Raiders of the North Sea. Now, this is a designer that I'm kind of looking for, you know, maybe in years to come as he develops more games, um, maybe he'll become the new Ryan Lockett or the new Uwe Rosenberg on my list where he's has multiple uh, entries throughout my, you know, top 60 or maybe by then my top 80 or 100. And um, with this one, what I like about it, it, it's a worker placement game, so at heart I'm going to tend to have some fondness for that. But one of the things um, that a lot of worker placement games have, which is a little frustrating for me, is that concept of kind of like feeding your workers. Now, I, what that is put, usually put in place for us to kind of put pressure on you because every turn you have to feed, you know, feed your workers so you have to get certain resources every turn to kind of keep up and usually the amount of resources you need to feed each turn is more so every turn you got to do more and more so it kind of puts a pressure on you but some of that's also takes away a little bit of the fun i don't mind the pressure necessarily it puts a little tension in the game but a lot of times you'll be taking actions picking things up because you're picking like food for your workers and you may spend a worker to pick an action to get you more food. And that's just kind of like the maintain everything. And that can be a little frustrating because it takes away from some of the fun actions you might want to take. Because then you might say, well, I would rather be placing this worker on this other spot where I'm getting resources to build this cool new building or this new item or whatever, depending on the game. Um, and those are more like the more fun actions I think you can take. But sometimes you sacrifice that by placing your, you know, feeding your people. Well, Raiders of the North Sea, finally a worker placement game. You're not feeding your people. So what this allows is you're spending your actions um, being able to do the fun stuff. Uh, in this game, you're, Vi you're Vikings, so you're like raiding, you know, hence the title. You're raiding different nearby villages, and usually when you raid a village, you're going to, you know, you're raiding and taking resources from that village. Um, but you also, like, um, you have three different types of workers. You start off with a black worker, and there's a gray workers and white workers. And um, the black workers tend to be, like, I guess the lowest man on the totem pole, gray in the middle, white is more the elite workers. And they can go on different spots on the board to, to do different things. So you kind of build toward that. So it's another game that starts off small and kind of builds up the bigger things, which I like. Um, also, there's a lot of puzzle aspect to it, which is another thing I like about games. Because in Raiders of the North Sea, you only, start, you only have one worker. You place it on a spot on the board, and either you're raiding a spot, and if you're raiding a spot, you're taking different resources, or you've got kind of a home village area, which has a bunch of different action spaces. And if you're placing your worker on, in the home area, you place your worker on the spot, generate that action, and then you take another worker off the board, pick it up, so you have a worker to place next turn. But when you pick up that worker, you're generating the action that the, the where you pick the worker up. So there's a lot of different puzzle figuring out like where you're placing your different pieces uh, to kind of get multi, you know, get the most actions. Like let's say there's two different actions you want to take in a turn. Well, if uh, one of the spaces is occupied, then you're going to be able to take those actions because you, you know, one, one is empty and one's occupied. Because you place your your worker that you have on the empty space doing that action, then you pick up the other worker from the occupied space doing that action. So um, you know, that's, you're kind of trying to plan the board out that way. Or maybe you're trying to see what your opponents are trying to do, and you want to make sure you don't leave the board for them that way. So there's, there's a lot of things going on. It's got that puzzle aspect. It's got uh, the you know, worker placement for different actions. Uh, you've got this resource management. Uh, you get different, um, you you get, you know, get different money. You have cards. The cards are going to represent different Vikings crew to your boat. And each crew, crew member usually has a different special ability. So you're going to hire in your different crew. So you know, building your, your crew for your boat, which is kind of interesting. You um, may end up sacrificing some of those work, you know, those, some of those crew members on your boat. When you go raid a village. Um, the, you know, one of the things there might be a Valkyrie in that village. And if you, you know, if you raid a village as a Valkyrie, that means you have to kill one of the crew members in your boat. That, you know, they've died in battle. But you're going to get victory points. The more, you know, more, you know, Vikings you send off the Valhalla, you're getting victory points for that. So that's kind of a strategy as well. But then there's a trade-off because now you have to hire more crew to fill your boat. So you're kind of rotating through crew, I like. Um, there's just so many things to say about this game. And this designer is uh, he's relatively new to the scene. Uh, in my... I can't remember exactly what number was that, but in the top 60, another game he made, Explorers of the North Sea, also made made my top 60. And he's got another game coming out on the Horizon Architects of the West Kingdom, which looks really good. Which I'm going to you know call it now and say... 
most likely my next next year when I do this do this again. I think um, I think we're going to see more games from Shem Phillips in the future. Now we go to my number two. My number two is another newer game. I've only been playing this one about uh, you know less than a few months now, and so it might be a little bit of a cult of the new to it. But I really like it a lot. Actually, when I was going through this list, I had it kind of listed at my number one. I've been kind of waffling between my number one. And my number two. But this one at the last moment, you know, I had to make a decision. So it settled in my number two spot. And that is Clans of Caledonia. Clans of Caledonia is a... Uh, it's kind of an area control game. But um, it has a lot of elements of the kind of your Euro. You can tell by the, you know, the you know, typical farming landscape. Juve Rosenberg is not the designer of this game. But it kind of feels like a Juve Rosenberg game. Which um, I think it was probably why, why I like it. It uses the basic game system of a game called Terra Mystica, which didn't make my top 60. I have that game, and I do like that game, but um, it didn't really catch you know catch my attention that much. I would play it again. I, I liked it, but this one, using the same system, but with more of the Euro feel, the farming feel, I ended up, even though I would normally like sci-fi as a theme more than, than farming, let's say, but I think the, it fits better for this game. What you're doing in this game is, um, you can kind of see on the board here, <clears throat> You've got, uh, you have your own home board on this game, and then there's like a hex board on, on like where you're doing the area control. So you're going to like pay for different spots on the board and place different things. You like pick them up your home board and place them on uh, the, the the main map. And what's kind of interesting for that is when you as you pick units up off your home board, like say you take play, take a cow and you place a cow in a field. When now you when you uh, remove the cow from your home board. It's going to have like a little milk icon. So it means every turn you're generating milk. So it kind of makes sense. The more cows you put on the um, on the board, the more milk you're generating. You may also need to, uh, you know, get the fill. You've got like different con different contracts you're fulfilling. And you may use those goods because you're kind of representing different clans in Scotland. And there's different resources that they would export, which is usually like milk and cheese and whiskey and bread and things but then you know for the contract you're basically you're exporting those goods to import other goods and those the, the goods you import really just kind of represent victory points but you're kind of use generating those resources to fulfill these contracts earn different victory points um but uh so the, the as you take the things off the board which is your, your off your home board it's like how it just kind of generates those resources for you but like one of the things you might do for contracts you might have to slaughter your cows for beef or your sheep uh, for meat as well and when you do that you take the cow off the board you place it back in your home board so it covers up you know the milk icon or the wool icon so next turn you have less cows on the board and less sheep on the board so you're generating less wool and less milk so the uh the game me mechanisms kind of thematically make sense and i kind of like that um the other thing that's also interesting for this game is you've got different clans and each clan has its own special abilities. There's uh, like a clan that's like all about selling milk for butter, so its milk's more valuable. Uh, you got another one you know, makes whiskey that you can uh, take the whiskey and you can kind of ferment it or kind of put it in storage. And the longer you have it in storage, the more valuable it comes becomes. And so I like that as well. So because you can play, um, it's got a lot of replayability because the map is modular. So every time you play the map, it's going to be different. The clan you get each turn is going to, or each game could be different with different abilities. So you can play different strategies. Um, the, um, you know, how the contracts come out is going to determine like which goods are more popular or prominent. So that's going to change your strategy and what type of uh, resources you tr you want to create. So it's, it's very, very, um, I like the, the, the resource management, very typical work, 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 Euro game, but, um, it also is just, a it's where some of those Juve Rosenberg games, I kind of talked that they can be uh, un a little unoriginal with except I mean, there's a few that then the more point salad games like Phil's Varro and, uh, Feast for Odin and things where you have a lot more options, but some of those you can kind of be doing the same. They have, maybe you feel a little same each game you play. Clans of Caledonia, the strategies you're going to do each each game is very different, just based on how you know the clan you're playing and how things kind of come out. And also very easily, you know, I haven't seen anything in expansions. I'm hoping for expansions for this one because I could think you could easily just make more clans, more special abilities, and so the, the game's got limitless possibilities. Uh, and that's why it almost made my number one and. It may be my number one if I play it more. But that is Clans of Caledonia. And now, finally, 
my number one game. Now you've seen I have a I'm a big fan of Euro games, obviously, and a lot of this list is dominated by Euro games. I just like the um, the resource management or the you know the interesting mechanisms. I like theme in games, um, but really I'm a big fan of just uh, the more meta level of the uh, of the mechanisms. And my number one game, strangely enough, not a Euro game. And this one. I kind of waffle where I place this one because it's kind of weird for me because I actually have not played this game in some time. It's been at least over a year since I played this game. But it was my number one last time when I uh, wrote up on Facebook. And the year before, when I made my first list, my top 40, it was my number one game. And I think uh, when I was writing this list up, I had it as low as number five or six. But then the more I started thinking about it, I was like, no, nah, this is a little higher. And really, right before I made this video, it was number two. But today, as I was kind of putting my list together, finalized my list, I was like, really? This is my favorite game of all time. And that is the Pathfinder Adventure Card Game. Now, what I like about this game is what kind of got me into gaming initially. Originally, it was Dungeons & Dragons. And then when I really got into gaming more hardcore and hanging out at you know game stores like the Wizard's Keep, was when I started playing Magic the Gathering. And this game kind of captures a lot of the things I liked about both D&D and Magic. It's a fantasy, th uh, I guess both have fantasy themes, but it has the RPG theme of like Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, Pathfinder, the basic Pathfinder game is a role-playing game. It's based off of Dungeons and Dragons. And uh, this is sort of, so this is sort of like the D&D card game. So it's card-based, so it's that's where the Magic element comes in. But it has the RPG elements of uh, kind of building like a character like you have in Dungeons & Dragons. What you do in Pathfinder is, it's a cooperative game, so everybody's working together, and you're going to, uh, each person's going to build a deck, and that deck's going to be based on a different character class. So if you're a wizard character, you're going to have more spell cards in your deck. And if you're a warrior character, you're going to have more armor cards and weapon cards in your deck. And each character's going to have special abilities based on their character class as well. And you're going to work together going through different scenarios. And then those scenarios usually you go to a location, and that location is going to have a deck of cards. You're going to draw the top card and encounter. And that might be an item that you've, you can find, you found. You might be able to acquire a new item, new spell, new weapon. Or you may, um, there may be an obstacle you have to overcome, like a trap, or maybe a monster you have to fight. And eventually you're usually looking, depending on the scenario, but a lot of scenarios you're looking for a particular villain as you're trying to work together and fight and overcome. Um, the the, game, the reason I haven't played it in a year is it's more of a campaign game. And that's probably the reason. There, there's multiple different campaigns, but that's probably the reason I haven't played it. Because it can be a little daunting. Uh, the campaign could be like you know, 30, um, 33, 35 scenarios. And so sometimes it's just a little easier to break out another game. But, you know, I could not include this as my number one, even though I haven't played it in a year. Because... Um, what you're going to do is, as uh, you can play those different scenarios, and when you play, so and there, every scenario probably takes about 45 minutes to an hour. So, so a lot of times I've played this game, we've played like giant chunks. We'll play all day and play through numerous different scenarios. But at the end of each scenario, usually there's a reward for the scenario, but you've also acquired different cards over the course of the scenario. And um, when you, at the end of the scenario, you have reconfigure your deck back to its original size. But let's say you've uh, found a better weapon or you know, a more powerful magic spell you um, you have to you know, configure your deck back to its original, like, you know, maybe you only have five spells in your deck. So, but you get to pick which five cards you keep. So you found a better spell, and then you jettison one of your weaker spell cards, and then keep the bigger spell. So when you go play in the next scenario, now your deck is better. So that's why it has the magic element. You're kind of building your deck. You're making choices on what cards to include in your deck as you go through different scenarios. But it's got that leveling up RPG, because your character's getting better and better as you go through different different games as you go through the entire campaign and that's why I like about the the Pathfinder adventure card game so much and um, that's so that's it we made it all the way through to number one I hope you've enjoyed these videos and if you as always if you have any questions about any of these games today or any other games feel free to stop in the Wizards Keep or message me on Facebook I'll be glad to uh, assist you any way I can I hope you've enjoyed these videos and um, Hopefully in the future I'll make some more different ones. If there's any uh, subject matter that you'd like to see another list on, uh, feel free to message me that as well. And until next time, thank you for watching.